Good evening, everybody. Thank you very, very much for coming. So, a few small housekeeping rules. So, we are being live streamed as well. So, could everyone on the live stream confer that they can hear and the lads can check in and make sure that it's going through? Um, the bathrooms are outside to the left and then to the right. The fire exits are behind me. And if you have questions, please could you raise your hand and a roving mic will come round to ask the question because if you ask it out loud, the live audience won't be able to hear. Um, and then any questions that come in will be fielded by one of my colleagues who will be able to ask it out loud and we'll go from there. Please could everyone put their phone on silent if you haven't already, just in case that interferes with the stream. Um, and yeah, otherwise, thank you very much for joining and I hope you have an interesting evening. So my name is Addie Kidson and I am customer sales support for the milking and cooling portfolio for Lely Atlantic. And I am very kindly joined by my colleague. Thank you. Um, so my name is Olivia Edgerton and I'm part of the same Atlantic team as Addy. Um, I work within the farm management support team. Um, so I support the aftercare of the robot portfolio. So just in case anyone's wondering, we work for Lely and Lely have a very vast portfolio of products. So I just wanted to give a very brief overview of what else we do, because I think Lely are probably best known for the milking robot. But we do a lot of brawn supportive products as well. So we have the collector, which is best suited to hard floors and has a 350 litre tank. We have the discovery, which is best suited for slatted floors, which will clean up again around the cows. We have the Luna brush, which is a cow brush. It's fairly self-explanatory. It helps keep the cows clean and stimulates blood flow, which helps stimulate milk flow. And we have what's called the Lely walkway, which is a foot bath that swings up out of the way so that it's free draining and can be refilled. We also offer a wide variety of feeding solutions. So we have an outer parlor feeder, which is called a Cosmix, which dispenses concentrate. And you can have up to three different feed types going through that. We have the Lely Vector, which comes with a kitchen and is a mixing feeding robot that automatically delivers feed and feeds on demand. We have the Lely Juno, which pushes up the silage that has been dispensed at the feed fence or grass if you're zero grazing. We have the Lely Grazeway, which is a very popular product over here, which allows cows fresh access to grass every eight hours. And then we have the Lely Calm, which is designed at young stock for feeding either powdered milk or fresh milk, it depends. Then we have the astronaut. So the astronaut is hopefully quite familiar. It is a milking machine and it has a hybrid arm, which means it runs on both electricity and air and is quiet, efficient and kind to the cow. Every single cow, every single milking is reviewed for fat, protein, lactose, conductivity, temperature and colour as standard. Nine millilitres of pre-milk is removed from each quarter every milking and there's per quarter removal to make sure that no teat is ever over milked and you have feed to yield and optimised options within the concentrate feed trough dispenser. Um, so on to our um, management support um, portfolio. So we have got the Meteor, which is an in-robot um, spray bar foot bath. Um, we have two types of collars available, um, which provide um, a, a range of um, features within them. So rumination, eating minutes, uh, activity, uh, heat monitoring, location, and health alerts as well. Um, we have our own Lely lights, so they are LED and they're tailored to the needs of each cow. Um, we have a treatment box which provides safe handling of the cows. And we've got our Horizon management software program so that you're able to um, look after the care and needs of your cows from the PC um, and a mobile app as well. Um, then on to free cow traffic. So um, this is a Lely concept by where the farmer facilitates the environment for the cow, um, but she decides what she does and when. Um, 
The farmer will also provide the five freedoms access to feed, water, comfort, so somewhere to lie down. Um, the, the carrier is able to exhibit natural behaviours, um, access to light and air, and that she's pain-free, so a healthy animal. And Laley supports the farmers to achieve this system um, in an enjoyable, sustainable and profitable way. So then everything Laley designs is centered around the cow. So the cow is the main focal point of all the innovations that the company have brought forward. They're all with mind to keep the cow as profitable and in the herd as long as possible, and obviously make the farmer's life easier. But the farmer's life is only gonna be easier if the cows are well catered for and well supported. And this brings us on to the nine cow tactics. Yes, yeah, so um, research shows that 20% of a farmer's cows take up 80% of their time. Um, so the nine cow touches um, make, make sure that you're um, doing little and often with your animals so that you're being proactive rather than reactive. Um, this makes your system more manageable. Um, over here in Ireland, seasonality will have an impact because obviously a, a lot of the work comes in the front end with spring carving, um, breeding and, and so forth. But it just, the whole concept of it is that there's less time firefighting and, and more time, um, yeah, being, being proactive to, to make the system more manageable. That's it from us, unless there are any questions from the Lally portfolio, but we have obviously the main event, which is our three farmers who have very kindly agreed to join us today. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Barrett on my right. Okay, thank you. Michael Barrett is my name. I'm farming in Newcastle West, West Limerick, and we're currently milking 150 cows, and we milk they're spring calving, so we milk about 15 to 20 in the autumn as well. And we started with the robots in March 2020 with two Lely AFIs, and we added a third run um, last March, three months ago. We added our third Lely. So um, just the numbers had grown, so it was uh, came, came to the stage where the third, third robot was needed. Fab, thank you very much. Ricky? Um, my name is Ricky. I'm originally from Germany and I came to Ireland five years ago. Um, <clears throat> in January last year, I took over a dairy farm that already had two established uh, Lely A4 robots on it. Um, I'm milking 130 cows. Um, I'm split calving, so most of my cows, about 80% of the cows are calved in the spring and 20% in the autumn to keep the robots busy for the winter, basically. Um, I'm rearing my own young stock, and I'm basically supported in my day-to-day -day by the farm owner as well as my partner. Fab, thank you. And then Jerome. Hi. Um, we um, converted over to robotic milking in March 2020. I am farming at home in West Limerick, in Erda, with my two parents. And, uh, yeah, we're very happy with the two robots now and uh, we're grazing on the ABC system and we're milking 130 cows and uh, yeah we're predominantly spring calving with only a few at the back end of the year but uh, yeah no it's uh, going quite well. Fab thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? I have one or two of my own if there aren't any burning ones already in the room. So, question number one to everybody. Um, how many alarms do you get? This is one of the most commonly asked questions, especially at open days and events that we put on. So, how many alarms do you get and what are they for generally? And I'm talking more critical, not your sort of day-to-day -day reminders to do things, your critical alarms that means there is a problem with the machine. Well, I guess you can, for people that don't know the setup, you can you can decide which alarms are critical or, and non-critical, and you can decide which alarms go off by day and which ones only go off or go off 24 hours. And you maybe once, once a month maybe, will be the last 
Um, it could be something simple like a cow could kick it off a cluster and it could get tangled in the cluster next to it and that'll fail the next milking. Something small like that, you know, or maybe something simple like a pull cart could get broken, you know, if a cow kicks it. And um, it can vary an awful lot, you know, and it's, and there is other alarms as well, which are just down to farm, farmer error, really, you know. Um, is um, things like the buckets being full, that's, you know, you don't really need to have that alarm gone off if you don't want to. I've actually switched off some of them alarms and it's, it's just works, works away. 100%. But generally speaking, it's only going to ring you if there's a fundamental issue that the robot can't milk. That's is that right. correct? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have it set that way now that you only get the phone call if, if basically the machine has stopped working, you know. Okay. So Ricky, would you find something similar? Yeah, like sort of for me, it would be every month or every two months, there'd be critical alarm, really. Um, I find with a good maintenance routine mm -hmm. and staying on top of things, um, you can sort of eliminate a lot of the critical alarms. I mean, there can happen at times you have, let's say, a cow um, that has failed in milking and then she keeps going around and round and round. Basically, after three times failing, she will be, basically, the robot will go out of operation thinking there's something critical, but it's literally just... She's being a pain. <laughs> she's just being a bit of a pain, yes. <laughs> but otherwise... Yeah, you mentioned about your maintenance routine. What does that look like? What's what's a maintenance routine do you have on like a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I was going to say basically there's two aspects from my side to it. There's um, every four months Laylee does um, their own maintenance on the robots, making sure everything is going fine. Um, but then I have my day-to-day -day routine, which comes down to keeping the robots clean. I find yeah. cleanliness is a very important thing. You would wash down your parlor at least twice a day as well. And the same applies to the robots. Um, also making sure that um, the main things like bleed holes are clear, um, allowing for airflow. Um, yeah, the laser is one key component for the robots to be able to find the paps, um, that, that is clean. Uh, but general cleanliness around the robots I find, if there is anything that you, let's say, as you said before, the hybrid machines, so they run off air, if you do hear air leaks, investigate that early on before they become an issue. It could be a seal that just needs changing. Um, be on top of that as well, like making sure all the detergents um, are filled up. Um, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. That would be sort of what I do for my day-to-day -day routine. Amazing. Thank you. Jerome, do you have anything to add on? Uh, yeah, no, once um, you do your daily routine and maybe every second or third week, kind of maybe just get over spectrum more thoroughly, um, like general maintenance is actually quite minimal. Uh, when the boys come in there three times a year, they go through the robot fully and um, anything that might be any issues, uh, any, no matter how small, it's, it's resurrected and a lot of it's preventative maintenance. So they'll, they go through their routine and change out things that not, might not even, that, that are still working, but might go eventually. So they will um, they all replace them, uh, replaceable items, you know, before they actually do go down. So downtime is kind of pretty low. Um, just following on from what you were saying in terms of daily routines, what, like this is a question to all of you, what, what do those daily routines tend to look like and what is the sort of time allocation to, to that daily routine? So how much do you spend on average with the robot itself each day and what, and what does that look like? Uh, time just spent actually standing at the robot would be uh, if you gave yourself 10 minutes morning and evening uh, and then there's a bit of looking at uh, tasks on the computer, so you could spend five to ten minutes on that as well, maybe twice a day. Uh, but you can get it on the Horizon app as well on your phone, so if you didn't make it to the computer, if you're doing something else, you can check it down the field or on the, on the road or anything. But um, uh, yeah, no, it is um, just basically cleanliness, volume wash it there, keep it clean and keep the laser clean. And uh, just, yeah, change, we change our filter twice a day. So we're just doing it morning and evening. So like that's only a, a minute job as well. So uh, yeah, to just um, just keep like a few minutes here, morning and evening does a lot of work. Good, has anyone got anything to add on that? Anything you do differently on your farms or? Well, I do think you probably spend, let's say around those tasks that you described like maybe a few hours a day, like between following up, like you get a lot of data from the cows coming through the milkings, through collars. Um, 
basically we have reports or lists that are available through Horizon that show you cows that could potentially need attention through the show signs of sickness, bees, mastitis, or just general um, lack of activity or eating minutes. Um, but just follow that up. Like, like I find you do change over from rather than being outside as much, you do have to go in and sit down on the computer actually proactively and just go through all the different tasks. You know, like it shows you health tasks. So if you have a cow on treatment, you have it in the system. It's basically more of a ticking exercise. Like there's very little left to that could be missed, basically. You, you help yourself organize your day. So do you find you sort of managing your day from the computer? So you, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're looking at the program to determine what you're then doing? Yeah, for me, basically, I, I come in, into the shed in the morning, I check the robots, I find they're running well, I give them a clean. Yeah. Um, and then basically the next thing would be going down to the computer and sit down and have a look through everything. Like this time of year now, it's cows on heat, finding the right time went to AI, sitting down there and making my bull choice that I have pre-selected, but just basically organizing myself that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, cows that are on treatment, um, I know which cows I have preset on draft so that they'll be automatically routed when they come into the robot. Um, that basically helps me structure my day and then going out, allocating grass, uh, because we do change readers rather than twice, we change them three times a day in the ABC system. Um, and then basically go from there, like. Mike, do you have anything to add? Because you were, you're interesting in that you used to have, or you still do, contracting as well as the dairy farm. Do you yeah, want to explain right. a bit about that? Yeah, that was my original reason for putting in the robot, was just to free up the time, that I wasn't going to be tied to the parallel, parallel every morning of the week at the same time. And it did do that, it did free it up, you know, you could go to it, go to the robot at five in the morning or you don't need to see it until later nine it's 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 totally flexible and and same same applies in the evening time is you're not you're not tied to a certain time of the day you know um and that was the reason that we we put them in in the first place and just getting back to your question about the alarms like we're predominantly uh, spring calving so an alarm a critical alarm this time of year a lot of people ask me about alarms at night time mm. but this time of year if alarm goes off at night time you do go out and you check it but in the month of October, you don't, you don't really get out of bed at three in the morning if there's a robot shut off because it's not, if they're not at peak capacity, it, uh, the other robot will keep, keep the cows milked, you know, until the morning. So it's not, it's not an issue all year round either, you know, alarms going off and um, it doesn't, it, it's not an issue like that, so. Yeah, because I guess all three of you are quite lucky in that you've got multiple. multiple. Mm, so yes. if there is a problem with one, you still have a another. Um, I would imagine it would be Less than ideal if both went down for whatever reason. You would want to react to that one quickly. So with the seasonality, how do you manage it from a sort of front-end loaded point of view? As in, you have everything happening within the first sort of, well, from depending on when you start calving, if we go from January right through to the end of June, you've got calving, breeding, your grazing season, your peak how do you manage that from a seasonality perspective? Yeah, look, it, it is busy that time of year. Robert or milk and parlor, it's, it's still going to be busy. That, it's just a busy time of year on a, on a dairy farm. Uh, one thing we find with the robot is training the heifers, mm-hmm. having pre-trained before the calve, start there, we calve around, start calving the end of January. So in the month of January, we get the collars on the heifers, and we get them trained. They get used to going through the machine. They get a small amount of feed. So at least in when they calve down, they know what the machine's about, they know it makes noise, and they know it gives them nuts. And, you know, it just it does make the job an awful lot easier when the when the new heifer is calved. And that's that things like that you can eliminate for, um, so you can eliminate a lot of the work for the for the springtime. That's good. Because you're slight Ricky's slightly different in that you said you've got a few calving down in the autumn as well. Yeah, so basically you go through calving twice a year. I tend to calve cows in the autumn outside, not not indoors, so that takes a bit of pressure off sheds. Um, but otherwise, as you said, it's down to recording a lot of information as well. Like, you know, basically coming from calving, you put down information regarding um, how did she calve down that? Was there any issues? You know, if you record that straight away, it'll help you later on coming to breeding. Is the cow that needs special attention. 
um, might she qualify for sex team and the likes of that, then once they're carved in, how will they go with regards to activity as well? Like you, you, pre you can recall very easily uh, pre breeding heats, see cows regularly cycling. Um, but as you said, like there's times where it's busy and then, then times where it eases off. Um, you know, I find later on in the year you might get away a bit before autumn carving, then get away with like that you can go away, that you, ha that you can enjoy the flexibility that robots provide. Like I think I find a lot of people when they hear, oh Jesus, you're robot milking now. It's like, what do you do all day? It's like, well, you do the <laughs> same thing as before. You're just not tied to the parlor twice a day. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it sounds to, and like you have that flexibility, you know. Let's say you have a bit of a slow morning, you, you know. You'd be like, Jesus, if I could turn around now and sleep another half hour, I would feel better. So you can do it. You have that flexibility. It's grand if you show up half an hour later. Like there's there's no cows roaring at at the gap in the field. <laughs> He's like, where where did you go? Like we were already half hour ago. Like yeah, you know, you, you have that flexibility. The same then during the day, if you have your sort of chores done, you you're sort of on top of things. You can go away for a few hours, you yeah, know, I'd say, right. especially for yourself as well, yeah, like, yeah. that you have that flexibility to just go off and, you know, do something else other than cows. Yeah. <laughs> off, off the back of that, then, sort of, what has been each of your own personal, um, like, what's been the biggest impact to your personal life from transitioning from um, a conventional system to the to the robots. What what's had the biggest impact on your on your life? Uh, flexibility is a lot of it. Um, you know, you can get up early there in the morning, do your few jobs around the robot, and head off for the day or for the weekend. And um, you know, there's there's no major panic. Um, therefore, just like taking holidays now is nearly easier because people are more inclined to give you a hand. They'll change the wires there and. Uh, do a few jobs around the robot where they're not so inclined to come on twice a day milking cows, but they might come in for maybe a half an hour, an hour, twice a day, so two or three hours in the day. But they can do that two or three hours any other, with what suits them like. So you know, actually getting help is slightly easier. So you know, going away for a night or two at the weekend is uh, a lot more achievable than you know, milking cows full time uh, twice a day, every day for three, every day of the year. But yeah, yeah, no, it's been great that way. Yeah, for me, the same. The flexibility is, you still sort of have your routine, um, but you have the flexibility around, you know, if, if you want to go somewhere, you can organize yourself. As you said, you can come in a bit earlier, get it done a bit earlier. You're not tied down as much in your day to specific times with regards to milking. Like, it is, it takes the pressure off, really. Like, and it, it might just be a mental thing as well, and you're not standing in a parlor you're feeling wrecked after milking cows for a couple of hours, mm -hmm. including wash up, like it, it is, you underestimate how much the physicality it takes, takes out yeah. of it. Like, you know, like you don't feel physically less wrecked maybe at the end of the day, if that, that's the right word to put it like. So yeah, definitely that like. Mike, how about you? Yeah, it's, it, there is a lot more freedom with it. Yeah, um, I just remember the first, just thinking there about the first year I had it on, Sunday morning, uh, went out to the yard about eight o'clock, did the few jobs. I was back in by half eight and decided when to go to, I think we went to Clarny or somewhere for the day. And I didn't come home that night till nine o'clock. You know, you couldn't do that with a milk parlor because you had to have somebody arranged to be there. Mm -hmm. Whereas it was, you know, you can do it on the spur of the moment because uh, the machine was still going to be there. And when you come home, you still had only 15 minutes work to do in the evening. You didn't have to face into two hours standing in the milk parlor. It's pretty good. Yeah. So this sort of leads on from what Jerome was saying about it's easier to get lads to come in and give you a hand. How has your labour changed since going from either traditional milking or whatever you were doing before to now? Like what, what labour differences are there on the farm? Yes, well, I had somebody milking five days a week before mm -hmm. and uh, I was at the contracting, so... Uh, I used to just do the weekends mainly myself and when I put in the robots in I just did both I did the look after the cows morning evening still was able to do the contracting during the day and I didn't have anybody full-time on the farm it's just a couple of part-time people coming in when it was needed but there was nobody full-time and I uh, just keep an eye in keep an eye on it on my phone during the day and could do my jobs morning and evening so labor went down Yes, yes, it reduced yeah. one person really. So. And would you be the same as Jerome? And would you find it easy enough to get someone to change wires and do filters and clean them down if you wanted to go away? 
Definitely, yeah. Look, my own two children would do it. You know, they'd, they'd move on the Finsware and they'd clean the robots, change the filters, and they, you know, they, they would do that. They're what, 17, 18 years of age, and they'll do that, no problem. They mightn't go into milk and parlor, milk 150 and Would they not? No, I don't <laughs> think so, but they would. They would do it in jobs, you know. So, and I suppose it's, the work is more, it's more interesting, really, like, you know, it's just the, the monotony of the of milk and cows, I suppose. Would they have much interest in the data side of it, as in would they be looking at yes, yields they and... They do, yes, they do look at that a little bit as well, yeah. yeah. Do they help yeah. you with breeding and general no, management not, not decisions? Moment, no, not no, yet. No, not yet. Work no. up to it. Yes, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Jerome, how about you, labour-wise? Because you, yeah, yours is really nice. Yeah, no, um, I say my two parents now, uh, like my father would have made cows like for years and years, so he's he's delighted with the change. So he's uh, <laughs> seen a, a big change, uh, but like the flexibility, like he he can still manage the cows. When I'm gone, we've gone up in cows as well since we put in the robot. So like uh, if I used to go away now, he'd have, he'd have to milk them or to get someone in. So that John, you know, like uh, you just have to kind of kind of keep everyone happy, like, you know, and work everyone to the bone. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's just, that flexibility is a main thing, really, like, yeah, and, like, people are interested in it, so to see it working, so they do, like, it is a bit easier to get that help, like, but you're not asking people to do a day's work when they are coming out to help you, you know, so, like, people will help you out, like, you know, when you are stuck. Yeah. Um. Another question I've got, I, we always get asked this, and, and over here, I think it'll, it'll be predominant as well, is how do you manage grazing with robots, and how do you get the cow to come back to the robot when she's out of grass? What, what, what does that look like? Oh, um, cows, uh, cows uh, are no trouble walking in and out. Um, we're ABC, so every eight hours they'll get a new paddock. Um, say A and B are about 40% and 40% of the days grass intake and then see is a nighttime block so they just eat that bit less but um if you you don't have to measure grass or anything to get the grazing right what but if you have too many cows coming together you don't have enough grass in the field and if they're staying out all day and they're not coming to the robot then you've given them too much grass so after a day or two you'll kind of figure out their mm -hmm. their pattern and uh, with the meal and the robot feed to yield um like the cows will come in for the meal and the relief of milking as well. So uh, like there's no problem with cow flow once you kind of just manage the grass fairly right. And it doesn't have to be perfect every day. Like some days you'll, you'll get it wrong, but the next day you'll know as like, oh, I'll just give them an extra little pole down or something in the field. And, uh, but yeah, it, it'll, you'll adjust that as you go along on a day to day basis, you will kind of see how the cows flow uh, and you'll adjust their grass accordingly then. Who um who learnt the robots faster, you or the cows? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the cows did. Um, we I wasn't collecting any cows after three weeks. Um, we had a new build, so the first week or two uh, was wasn't tough. We just spent a lot of time. Once the cows would make no problem, but um, in the new they just moved into the new shed the week before the robot, so they didn't know where to go. So I had to push them out of the robot towards the grazeway gate and once they got out of the gate they went to the field themselves so but yeah they, they take to it very quickly how do you manage your um grazing system then ricky well i sort of have to be in slight disagreement with regards <laughs> to you don't need to measure grass i do measure grass regularly once a week walk the farm like anybody else does and i do take great joy nearly in it getting it just right with the grass so basically you do allocate eight hours worth of grass for the cows um, three times a day in three different areas of the farm so they sort of don't go the same way. The cow have free access to the paddock so they're never locked in, you just leave the gap open and they walk back and forth. I would nearly go as far as to say my cows do know the time because they are back on time before the gate changes oh, yeah. to go out, like they learn that very fast, they're yeah. loving it. Um, you do work, like I'd say grazing is I wouldn't say more effort, but you, you just think about it more because you're not tied down to, let's say, a, a tree grazing size paddock. I have fairly big, large paddocks where we just removed wires. Yeah. And it's more so you work with a back and forward reeler. So you, you could end up changing these six reelers a day, but it's well worth it. It's preserving grass. It's basically the forward reeler is the fresh grass the cows are eating. And then basically you want nearly just a grazing worth of basically yesterday's grass like where they were in the patch they were yesterday 
and then have the battery law of that. So you have that regrowth coming up right behind the cows. So that they don't go back over areas and eating away what you want for the next round. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do find there is a bit of a, a knack to it, but it, it, it's not rocket science. Um, you know, it, it, it is similar to you, you do your um, allocation similar to rather than 12, it's eight hours. Um, and the cows basically, as you said, the cows will tell you if you get it right mm-hmm. or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You still have a lot of decisions to make if you're indoors, as in what feed types you're going to put in and you work yeah. with a nutritionist. So I suppose it's just the same, but on a different level. At times, I think it's it's a slight bit thinking outside the box. You know, I find now driving through the area, like we're in northeast Cork, there's a lot of dairy around. Mm-hmm. I find robot grazing for like in the shoulder seasons, it's actually, I'd say, nearly kinder to the ground. Yes. Uh, we would be more on heavier ground. But because the cows, there's gaps everywhere, mm-hmm. so you can really allocate grass in, in any form or shape that you want, and the cows can go over it once. Yes, and you're not poaching. And you, or... You're not poaching. They're not trapped at any gaps. So you, you drive to the countryside, let's say, in March, and, and jays is not, there was some plowing <laughs> going on, I'd say. Um, judging by now, looking at it now, there was some plowing going on. <laughs> I'd say you'd know who was a robot and who wasn't with yeah, the gaps. Yeah, and, and it's literally that way. We're like, well, Jesus, it did bucket down rain, and, and but we knew the cows only go over it once, Yeah, and that's it. So you, you can get away nearly with murder in one <laughs> grazing, and because the cows, if they aren't happy, they come back to the shade, Yeah, and they can be back in the shade. And, and so it, it is kind, especially in the shoulder seasons, on the ground, I would nearly say. Like, there is very little poaching going on, you know. And even, like, there's a lot of people come up when you go somewhere and they'd be like, Jesus, that spring now was horrendous. I'm kind of thinking, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad, like, <laughs> because it is that freedom of the cows. Like, they can decide what they want to do. And if they ain't happy, they can come back to the shed and they can stay around and They'll tell me know. that they're not happy. But they do that in the shed, like. Yeah. So that would be my take on it, like. But it's no more difficult than grazing, no. grazing for an ordinary big compeller. Yeah. That's the same, like, yeah, but but it's actually the cows, you never hurry cows in and out, like, you know, it, it's, the cows are there and, and they learn the system very fast. Even I, 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 as I said, I had an established chart there, but I also bought in a few cows and it is fascinating to watch their characters in that regard. There's some that take to it like a duck to water, and there's some that just need that, as you said, that smidge of encouragement mm-hmm. to be shown where to go. And, and but they cop on very, very fast, like yeah, you know. And so very intelligent animals. I don't think we give them enough credit. No, that's the thing. Like I think that's that's if you do put in a robot or if you do work with robots, that's what you get to see is like actually how, how they shine, are. you know, yeah. their own personalities. Like like there's cows. I find that it fascinates me every day. Is Yes, you have the whole bunch that comes in near the gate change, out yeah. the fresh grass. But you have those ones that time their milking to, Absolute that they're ready to perfection. go out at the gate change. They come in a few hours later in a hurry. They get into the robot, get knocked, and out they go eating again. It's like... They know. They know. It's very fascinating. Like From a grass management point of view, because you've got quite a lot of variation in your... That's right, but it's, it's no different to uh, the milk and parlor. If you, give them, if you don't give them enough grass with cows in, in the milk and parlor, you're going to be, you'll see it in the, in the bulk tank, you'll see it in your bottom of milk, and it's the exact same with the robots. And it's, it's no more difficult. Some people worry about it, but it's not, it's not any more difficult than getting the grass right for a, for a herd of cows. Conventionally. Which you're parlor, yeah, same thing. So we've sort of talked about grazing as a setting it up. Infrastructurally, sheds, grazing, land... What was your sort of investment to change? So did you have to change buildings? Did you have to change track layouts? What was your sort of transition in? Okay, at the start, my original plan was to put the two robots into the existing mixing parlor. That would have been a mistake because it wasn't room, it wasn't uh, looking enough. Um, I got uh, talked out of it and I built a new uh, building. So the new building basically comprises of there's an, just an extra 24 cubicles, and it's got an extra 70 foot of uh, feed barrier, and that was that was a good decision to go that way because it would not have worked in the old too too confined an area, and that was basically what we had to do on the building side, and on the farm roadways then we had to do uh, two lengths of roadway just to get the cows or around to the other side of the yard mm-hmm. in two different directions, and I think each one was around 
uh, was only 300 metres and the other was about 600 metres. And they joined up with the existing roadways in. And that's all we had to do on roadways. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a major, it was, you know, it was a very small part of the, of the whole changeover operation. The farm roadways was actually very small. We were looking at our farm yard that's pretty central in the block of land. That was a, a benefit, you know. Bob? Jerome? Um, with regarding ro we we built a new sh sh shed on the greenfield site, so we designed the robots uh, specifically for that shed. Uh, so layout was uh, was quite key. Uh, but uh, regards roadways, we uh, we had two roadways anyway, uh, so we just had to add on a, a third one beside um, one roadway as a dual carriageway. Uh, but it was only something like a little over two hundred meters. Uh, but that was all. I even did that at the after year one. I didn't even do it starting up. So, um, you know, like uh, roadways aren't a lot of people be worried about roadways and everything, but it's it's actually not that major of an issue uh, because a lot of people have good infrastructure anyway in for roadways. Yeah. So, uh, a lot like a very little change actually would um, organise the thing quite well for robotic milking. I suppose if you're an absolute greenfield, your Lally Centre will talk you through mm. mapping out your land availability as to where cows would want to go. So then maybe your infrastructure would be a little bit higher. But if you are an existing dairy farmer, then it's just a case of adding for accessibility. Yeah. Plenty of uh, gaps, gaps at the roadway is, uh, is a lot of it. Like it, you've great flexibility then uh, throughout the stages of grazing, you can make your strips of grazing wider or shorter, like so um, just to just to whatever grass is in the paddock. Hmm. What would be sort of the biggest piece of advice that you guys could give to someone who's maybe considering robots at the moment? So they're maybe watching this or they're, you know, they're, they're inclined, they've been to a show or something and seen the robots. Like, what, what would be your um, sort of key piece of advice? Um, I advise, uh, if you're really interested in it, to just go and talk to farmers themselves that have put them in and uh, just talk to them and see how they got on. Like, um, I'd originally planned on putting in a 20 unit parlor, but I always had robotic milking in the back of my head, but um, I eventually went down the, the road of robotic and uh, happy since. But I did go around to a lot of farmers and went overseas and went to Holland as well there and seen a lot of them. So, but yeah, just anyone you know who has a robot, like nearly go and talk to them and see how they got on, like, you know, but um, definitely try well, and talk to as many people mm -hmm. as you can. What was your swaying point then? You said you were you were going to put in a parlour. What what actually turned you then to oh, the I was, robots? I was nearly surely I was nearly nearly there with putting <laughs> in a twenty unit parlour like I wasn't far <laughs> off it. But uh, just there, like uh, the people aren't around. Uh, you know, if you want to get away, like it's grand doing the work and all. But therefore, if you want to get away at all, anything happens or anything. But um, you've no one to turn to. Unless you imply someone full time, like, but we aren't at that scale uh, to probably imply someone full time. So, uh, you know, that's why we just kind of went robotic because um, just the, the labor isn't out there, like, you know. And then if we were to go, we'll say conventional, we'd probably have to go open cows more, which is more infrastructure cost, and then imply someone full time. So it's just kind of the scale kind of got to it plus labor. What about you, Mike? What obviously for you, you've got the um, contracting business, so that will have had, as you said before, that had a big impact on sort of your choices. But was there any? Were you considering other options as well when you were looking down this route? Or um, originally, I looked into my first research into robots started back in two thousand fourteen. I went to the plow match and um, saw a few of them. And somebody, some sales rep came out and turned me against them. And he was from another brand of robot. It was from another brand of robot. And it, uh, I had a 10 unit parlor. I extended it to 14 at the time. And it was a big mistake. I, I remember for a long time because if I had put in the robots back in 2015, you know, they would have been well established yeah, at you this would. stage. And it was, uh, it was a mistake. We Should you be upgrading A4s to A5 at this That's stage? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it would have been, um, you know, it would have been, it, would have, it was the right time to put them in, but I didn't realize it at the time. And that's what we should have done. But like, you do your research and do research in them, but maybe not to overthink it. 
where people, you know, no matter what you're buying, if you talk to enough people, you'll somebody's going to say, yeah. yes, you'll talk yourself out, or somebody will talk you out of it. They'll say, oh no, that's that's not the right thing to buy. If you're buying a Rolls Royce, they'll probably somebody tell you that's not the right car to buy. You know, <laughs> not for Irish roads. No, it's not. probably not. <laughs> So it's the same with the robot, like, you know, um, a farmer said to me once, he said, the people who get most trouble from robots are the people who don't have them at all. I saw his point, you know, yeah. some people say that they will get trouble, you know, but that's... Um, they don't have them themselves. Yes, that's that's correct, yeah. That's, yeah. So maybe not to overthink it, you know, if you think it's right for you, and look, they have, they have been proven, you know, they are working, so... Yeah, Mickey. we've got enough out there to sort of say that, you know... and. I'd like to think enough people are happy with them because of how many there are. So they, mu they must be doing something right somewhere. Got to be doing something right somewhere. <laughs> Ricky, what made you go... Because obviously you could have managed any kind of dairy farm anywhere. Yeah. Was there a... Was it the opportunity? What made you well, there take was, over? For, for me, there was two things. I managed a robotic dairy before in Australia. Um, and I was always intrigued by robotic milking because of the amount of data that is available, like there is yeah, much really passionate about the information. Yeah, no, it is literally there at your fingertips, you know, like it's not that she wait for milk recording to see how she's doing for cell count and fat and protein. It's yeah. just right there, like every day after every single milking, which is brilliant, like. Yeah. And so I was always attracted to that and having managed um, Lady Robots before in Australia, when I saw that opportunity, I was like, yeah, no, that's, that's the right fit. That's the right time to go for it. I'd say I have two pieces of advice. One maybe came from a comment you just made earlier because the robots that I'm working on, the A4s, yes. they are, they'll be in 10 years now this summer. Yes. And so we'll be hoping for another strong 10 years, oh, keeping absolutely. the maintenance up. You know, there is basically maybe people would say, oh, what about longevity? Like, because you can put a parlor in and it'll be in for 20, 25 yeah. years. Like, and I'd say it's the same with robots. Like, you know, if you keep the maintenance, the upkeep up, that is the aim. Like, you don't have to upgrade, as you said, or just by this time, because yeah. we put them in and they were put in in 2013. So we'll be going strong 10 years this summer. Yeah. And He's a tractor head, you see. So he likes the newest oh, model yeah. all the time. <laughs> like, you know, it's, there is not necessary. There's, There's no need a, for it either, though. Yeah. No, you know? absolutely no need. There's robots up in the north that have been in 21 years mm. and still mm. not going missing strong, a beat. You know? But it's like, it's like a car or a tractor. Yeah. If you keep it maintained and, and you look service, after it and look after mm -hmm. it, it will stay working, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, any machine will, yeah. and any machine that's going 24 hours a day is going to need service and maintenance. Exactly. And, yeah. Well, that's, I, think, I think a lot of people tend to forget as well as like a comment as someone says, oh, geez, they're after, you have another breakdown. Like, you know, if you don't talk to people that regular, you know, it would be just, but it's like, if you consider actually they're running 24 Four, seven, seven. Right. you're not just milking, let's say four hours a day or five or whatever it is. It is 24 seven there. And if you check, you can check the profile and my robot says cows going through every hour of the day. You have a really nice report on a yeah, graph, a which graph will show you sees. exactly how many milkings have happened per robot per hour of yeah, the day. Yeah. And it's a really good one to look at when someone's just started to show actually you might think that you know yeah. you come out to look at the robot and you go oh my goodness there's no cows here look at that report and yeah, you'll see yeah. actually they really are very consistent yeah and i'd say my other piece of advice maybe would be to people is go out to someone and shadow them basically pick up routine tasks that you know in the whole excitement of starting you up or, or getting into robots newly is that go to someone that is established ask them sort of what is your routine Possibly, if you have the time, shadow them even just to mm. see what it is that they are doing in the day to day. Like even myself now, there was six years between Australia managing robots there and here, and it was the same robots was A Force in Australia as well. So you're very familiar with so the machine very familiar, it, But it was nearly like there was a lack of like the muscle memory was there, but it was more so refresh it. Yeah. What was it that I did six years ago? Because there's a lot of time, you know, there's a lot of water gone down the river in that time, like, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really, is that going out, proactively approaching people and be like, listen, could I just, you know, even there in the morning, what is your routine? Could I just come out and be with you for a couple of hours and give you a hand and see what it is that you're doing and take it from there, like. Did you um, see a difference in the cows? So going from a parlour to a robot, how, how did the cows react to it? Did, um, and what, what did you see in terms of those reactions? Um, cows are very quiet since, they were kind of generally quiet anyway, but now um, they're very um, quiet. Like they just stand there chewing the cud. They wouldn't even get out of your way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like, but uh, see, they're, 
there's no one after them, so they're just in their own little time. And they, they, if they want to eat in the field or come into the robot, they can do it on their own schedule. But uh, production has been massive increase. Uh, feed to yield is probably the main driver for that. Um, just, uh, just the cows that just uh, turned inside out nearly, uh, and the production we're getting out of them. But we're not driving them too hard, like you know, they're, they're, the production is probably there in the breeding, only just to probably you're feeding the good cows what they need, uh, but you're not wasting really meal because um, you're only supporting what they're, produ they're producing rather than uh, pumping them up meal. You know, like if they if they're not yielding, they won't be fed the higher rate of uh, meal. So. Uh, but yeah, it's just... Um, it's reactive to each individual yeah. cow. Yeah, you're just supporting the cow and what she needs. Uh, so our conception rates are phenomenal since as well. Um, we've only la uh, had a couple of cows the last couple of years, uh, with empty cows, but there's even cows, old cows there now that uh, shouldn't be going in calf in the air. <laughs> so we've, we've a couple of 10 and 11 lactation cows that should be leaving, but they're still getting calf every year. Like so. I, you know, like, uh, Keep them the, going. the system is working, like, you know, on the cows, so that the cows are good. Good. Um, have you, I, I mean, Ricky, you probably haven't worked with the same animals on... I actually brought cows from one farm. Oh, I was working okay. On yeah, one. so can, and, could you see the difference in those animals? Yeah, I'd say they love the freedom. Like, and I was kind of having worked with those cows before it's like I kind of knew that they would be doing well on robots and and it was the case and they just literally took like a duck to water like it's it's I think once they pick up that freedom of movement they have um going through the robot going through the whole system they really do enjoy it like you know they can make sure they have full bellies three times a day it's as if they relax isn't it they, they, like, it is it is it. like and it's like the same as well like it's nearly like if you want to go through the cows you have to push your way through like they wouldn't <laughs> necessarily move like it is very fascinating, you know, to see like there is there is no pressure on the cows really, like yeah, you know, they have their own freedom to do how they please. What about you, Mike? You... Well, I think like the cow does what she wants when she wants in the robot. She wants to lie down, she lies down. She wants to go milking, she goes into milk. There's nobody hunting her into milk a certain time of the day, you know. Yeah. Um, I was in a farm last year. They were milking 430 cows, and I was just what just watching them going up the farm roadway in the evening and something to drive them with a quad like and you know it was like it's, forcing it's them down, forcing them down along the farm roadway mm -hmm. whereas you know mm -hmm. that is I was looking and I said god that's severe on cows I see our cows just walk away at their own pace there's no rush they stop they look around them they walk on another <laughs> bit you know it's just they're totally relaxed and um, I was I was told as well before I put in the robots it, it would be very difficult to do things like uh, putting up dry cow tubes in cows at the end of the year because there'd be no because you're never handling. But yeah. it's actually the opposite. They're actually mm -hmm. a lot quieter to put up the dry cow tubes than when they were in the milking parlour. It's actually a lot easier to tube a cow. She stands way quieter. They're just used to the machine interaction. And um, I found it a lot easier than I was in the milking parlour to, to tube a cow. Just in relation to ease of management jobs, um, you were at Silage today, Jerome, for sure, <laughs> and you were at Silage recently. How does doing silage impact the roadways and the free cow traffic concept? Because that's another quite common question we get, especially in grazing, or lads that are curious about grazing. How does the silage harvesting impact free cow traffic? Doesn't it really affect my, my main block of silage because it's not on the, home, on the home block of land anyway. So it's okay. drawn in from outside outside. But lots. your pit's on the... Yeah, so it just get across to the pit. But you can, you can just put up a strip iron and lay them across the corner of the field, you know, you don't... And it doesn't really... It doesn't, no, it'll still work away. There is, it's easy enough to find ways around it, like, you know, you don't need to, um, you don't need to make any major changes. And same with spreading fertiliser or spreading slurry, like, if, if cows are coming up the farm roadway and if there's wide enough and you go down against them, they, they'll just pass you and, you know, they'll, they'll go away and do their own thing. They know, they know where the robot is and they know what's, where the feed is and that's where <laughs> they're going to go, that's where they're going to go, like, you know, so they don't... Um, it's not hard work. It's, it's not really hard work, you know. Do you find the same? Well, yeah. For us now, the pit is basically like there's access to the pit outside of uh, grazing structure, basically. Yeah. So you kind of time it that way, like like the tractors drive through a field that is used for the day grazing, but it's basically you kind of time it that you don't go grazing that field the day of silage. Right. Um, so you the same as well. I have a bit of silage, first cut silage on the milking platform. 
every year and it's more so timed that for us we have access through the night grazing block so we basically say like by nine o'clock they sort of stop going in there for us and then it is kind of timing in that way either than making sure cows are either locked away for that time that cows that might be left in the grazing or clear that grazing out um, and then time the tractors that they do travel there when there's no cow traveling it's mm -hmm. just if you have contractors coming in it, it just is that ease of mind that you do know there's nothing that can go wrong because cows are used to going where they want to go so that it's either then a job of locking them in for the time when they're traveling past um, or basically picking a time when you pick up silage because we have an outblock to pick up silage as well yeah but you time it at basically those those times like the same with slurry putting out slurry while grazing it is the same principle basically picking times in the day which is, can be easily done, you know, like if you have an outblock or somewhere else or other paddocks to pick up, you can kind of time it around where the cows will be. You know, it does take maybe a bit of thinking, but I think it's... So like it's you always said takes earlier, a bit of organizing, the box. You know, mm. and yeah. you kind of do know, like, like I know if I drive through the field and if there's a good cover, I might just clear that out. It might be in the rotation, but mm -hmm. I do know tractors are going to go through it in, let's say, three days' time. I'll just clear it out, graze it for the next couple of days so that there's low cover in it which means less damage to the ground and no grass wasted. But there's also really no cow in the field then when they have yeah. to drive through that lake. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I took uh, surplus bales there off the paddock, uh, a few paddock, well, actually out of the tree grazing blocks. And uh, literally only for like a half an hour, an hour, put up a wire, stop the cows in your way, do your job and out. Like, and they're not too upset by that lake. So if you do have a lot of work in one block, like a slurry or something, you could just, Put double your allocation for a say one grazing block, so when you go into two fields instead of three for that day, but it might only be one day, and you'll get all your work done, and then do it maybe different another day, like if between slurry and stuff like that's probably your slowest job. But fertilizer, you're just in and out, uh, opening gaps, like so it's it's quick enough that way, so they're not too bothered. And contractors do pick up on it as well, you know, they be like, oh, so where the cows? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of familiarity with that. <laughs> Do we have any questions from online before we get even more carried away? Hey, can I ask some questions? So um, we've all talked about how uh, many alarms we get over, you know, uh, once a month, uh, once every two months, um, and the flexibility that that offers. But then whenever we're off farm, we go, do we go away with the confidence that we're not on call? Well, in theory, you are on call because it is a system that operates 24-7. So I think that might just be something you have to be cautious about. It's not like at the end of the day in a traditional system, you do lock the cows in and bang, that's it until, let's say, 6 o'clock or whenever you start. Again, the next morning, there, there could always be something going wrong. But I find, as you said yourself earlier, like during peak, you would be inclined to go out in, during the night and just have a look. I myself actually live about 20 minutes away from the farm. So I just decide, I'm just hardcore. I say, well, it's tough sheets. <laughs> but it is, it's that time of year where, where, where you be sort of inclined. You know, there's times you do go out and just make sure everything's running smoothly, whereas other times of year, especially if you have more than one robot, where you say, well, I get away with only one robot. I mean, the, the alarm calls, you can, if you are going away on a, a good holiday, you can, you can divert them to somebody else's phone, whoever's looking yeah. after the place. It's, it's easy to change the, the phone number that it alarms, you know, so if you have somebody looking after the place, you let them deal with it. Yeah, but I think you, you said that you have uh, kids at home that can sort out stuff like that as well. That's right, yeah, yeah. And, uh, like a lot of the time, it's only, it's only minor, minor um, issues, you know. Ma a machine could shut down, like Ricky said there, if a cow comes through it three times and fails somebody king, it could shut the machine down, you know, and uh, I've, my mother's 70, eight years of age and she has often gone out and restarted the farm and just tell her what buttons to press on the mesh screen and she'll get it restarted and the machine works away again you know so it's not like it's, it's not rocket science you know it's so it's not okay um and we talked a lot about the uh, grazing and infrastructure i would like to know a bit more about how and what technology is on the machines that you use to identify a uh, health um in that in the cows so you're talking about cell counts heats stuff like that so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, <laughs> anybody <laughs> like? 
Um, well, basically, the cows wear collars, so um, you get eating when it's on that. Uh, you get activity, which helps in heat, uh, with heat detection. Um, so that they are already sort of great indicators. Even in activity, you can sort of see, you know, is she sort of basically kind of stop moving nearly, like. Um, but also, you have cell count. So basically, every mil milking is analyzed for cell count through the MQC. Um, that gives an indication. You have lists then where she comes up for other health. So you go through that twice a day, basically, just to see if there's a cow on it or off it, which allows then for individual just pulling cows out of the tank. Like at times, cows just get a random spike of cell count without actually an incident of mastitis. So you do need to, you do need to check the cows. You have the help and of the connectivity as well of the milk, which gives you an indication which quarter would be most likely impacted. And that basically, you already go with that information to the cow, knowing what is going on. You have the temperature in the milk. Um, you have a general health report that gives you an indication even of the sick chance. So it could just be, let's say, she's away for 15, 16, 17 hours, but you just know, well, it's just, she's always like that. She's just a lazy cow, or she's late in her lactation, or whatever it is. So, you are trying to check up on her, but you also know your cows, sort of, that you say, Jesus, oh, she's just a bit of a lazy bum, like, you know, so, like, that's kind of the information that you do have. Just to jump in on that, then, has, um, you mentioned, like, mastitis, then, has your mastitis treatment plan changed from going from a parlour to a robot? Like, do you, do you treat them differently? Are they, do they recover quicker? Are cases lower? Like, what, what differences have you seen in terms of mastitis from going from one system to the other, if any? Um, well, uh, because of all the data, you could probably pick up uh, mastitis probably a lot quicker. Um, their cell count would probably rise before they get the conductivity, which is the clots in the milk. Uh, so you could treat, I treat a lot of them with boluses, uh, and it seems they get a lot of them, uh, so it does, yeah. So you don't need to keep out the milk or anything, so in one, one or two treatments uh, can uh, cures a lot of minor cases, that spikes in this mag cell count or anything like that, yeah. What about you, Mike? Do you see any yes, differences? Yes, well, you have, you'll have the information on that health list, you know, once you check that mor uh, morning, evening on the computer, you have the information there, it's only a matter of going checking it, and it gives you the, the percentage, the sick chance of a cow. So top of the list is your, your most serious ones, you know? Yeah. And you work down along and, you know, it's, it's usually only a couple of cows, you know, at, at, at most, you know, you'd be hoping, you know? <laughs> and you just treat them and that's, that's it. You know, the information is there. It'll tell you, it'll tell you what quarter, it'll tell you her conductivity, and it'll give you her cell count as well, and her temperature, and should, that's kind of all the information you need, really, to treat a cow, isn't it? So. Have you got any other questions? Yeah, no, I just have a uh, wondering about your call decisions. So from moving to conventional milk into robotic uh, milking, has that changed what you look for, the criteria on call decisions, then moving on to breeding decisions? Yes, well, it, no, we have basically have milk recording every day, every day of the year, every milking. So you have fat, you have protein, and you've got kgs for every whole milking, so it's huge. I mean, what I thought was my best cow before we put in the robots wasn't the best cow when we started getting the inf looking at the information. So uh, we can, as you know, in this side of the country, we get paid on, on fat and protein. That's, that's most important for us, rather than volume. So that's, what, and that's, that's really what the, the culling decisions is, is based on. Um, originally, I thought your, the question was about um, culling cows and we started the robots, but I just want to add, we, we didn't cull any cows. <laughs> We didn't call any cows when we started the first year. Uh, we started with 120, 125, I think, and no cow was called. Every cow would have milked in the parlour, milked on the robot as well, you know. And then what about your breeding decisions now? Yes, those, you know, which ones to breed? Yeah, okay, you can use the data there. But what about what sires and what you look for? Yes, well, you look, you look for a cow with good teeth placement. And uh, most of the, if you look through all the eye catalogues now, the bulls, the certain bulls are robotic uh, suitable, so that, that basically covers tea placement and temperament as well, you know. Um, so you can, you, can, you can pick out that in the, in the bull. Milk speed would be another one. Milk from speed would be important, yes, yes. Uh, I can't think of the word. Uh, probability kind of no, uh, productivity output. output. So yeah. you're looking for 
box time and utilisation right. of the machine. Mm -hmm. So milk speed would be quite a big one, I think. That's a right. lot of people would make decisions on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe. When we were talking earlier about cows, I think it might have come across a bit like we're only looking at the computer, but you even have the other way around. You are out and amongst the cows and you see something be like, there's something not quite right here. Or like we had it there in the spring where the cow, she came inside and rather than going up to the robot, she just bang, lay it straight away down. But it was grand then to basically go, be able to go back into her cow cart and just see what was happening. You could see there was a dip in eating minutes, so she wasn't eating as much. Um, she wasn't as keen to eat. Um, we could see rest feed that she left in the robot. Um, but you'd already seen milk her eat. physically. Yeah, so basically, you'd then gone she, back. she caught our attention. Like you can yeah. work it either way. Like it is the robot telling you cows you mightn't have picked up, but it's the same even with heats. Now you say, I just kind of rely 100% on the collars, but it's oftentimes you do see the cows actually acting amok already, and then they come onto the list. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's that you still work it either way. Like you're not just entirely relying on the data that is provided to you, but it's a great addition if you pair the two together like you know and as I said with the cow it was great to see she hasn't started dipping in her milk yet but 12 hours later she was so we were basically able to pick her up even before she herself was basically showing clinical signs of sickness and we were able, I was able to treat her straight away yeah. but it's, it's that combination as well as if you do see an animal that is struggling but you can go back and sort of even see not just how she did today but you can see how she sort of went on since calving or with the last fortnight and so on, like, you know, you do have a month's worth of data yeah. backed, you know, you see the behavior graph, what was happening um, with her, like, you know, my car at that time, she had heat a couple of days before, and I'd say she just got a bit exhausted, <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> <laughs> forgot to eat and was paying the price then. But it, it is just those, you know, it, it was less of a guessing game, like, I could go through all the parameters, um, and it just helps you, like, I could see her cell was fine, like, yes, I'd still drew her down, but it was still, you could have the parameters, there was no spike in cell count, her yield was consistent up to then. Um, it, it just helps you sort of eliminate what could be her troubles like. And it was then easy to see, she did have a heat a couple of days before, she just, I'd say, just over the little bit. Swift. Sure, don't we all sometimes? <laughs> yes, yes. But, you know, it just helped, and then basically going down the right route, it, it sort of eliminated even having to call the vet, because you do have that information even if the vet does come out and you'd be like well i'm at the end of my tether i don't know what's going on with her you get yeah. the vet out and um it just helps make even for the vet to make better decisions you know like you can go back and say listen you know that's it's not just well i'd say she was fine and then she wasn't it's more so you can actually pinpoint it down yeah multifactorial assessment yeah yeah you can see if a cow is sick and you treat her you can see if she's if rebounding or not if or else if she's staying going down and down like you will see an improvement in her eating minutes and rumination and like she'll just uh, she'll just get better like you know you can see a reaction to the, the treatment you're giving her mm. even there in the spring i find um, which is a grand indicator as well as ketosis yeah oftentimes mm. ketosis does go subclinical so you don't really see it but because we have fat and protein on the robots it gives you an alarm even for the risk of like that she's most likely having a case of ketosis which aids then in treating her fast and making sure she keeps rocking on. I like that. At the beginning, um, Olivia presented about the nine cow touches, which I suppose is the principle of doing your routines proactively. So obviously being block calving, a lot of these routines all happen at the same time. Your hoof checks, your PDs, your vaccines, um, your dry offs. How do you manage that? Because uh, in a conventional system, your cows are all in a routine, whereas now, they're free to do what they want. How do you manage these routine tasks in a block calving system? We just put the cows onto drafting. You mean like if you want to vaccinate all the cows in the one day, we just put it onto every cow onto drafting. So they're all drafted out into that area, out by the crush. And the minute they're done, they're back into the, into the grazing routine again. Simple enough, you know, the, if you start this, I mean, if you want to start your vaccinations at nine in the morning, you start drafting them from maybe five or six, so when you come out in the morning, you have, you know, 30 or 40 percent of your cows in the yard. And by the time you're finished, you hope you have them all <laughs> in the yard, you know. So it, 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 it works well that way. It's same with a hair test or anything. It's the same applies. So that's what we do. Well, I kind of try at times as well. You do know, let's say, 
the nine o'clock is a very uh, sort of a popular time for the cows to go out into the day grazing, out of the night grazing. It's basically just locking them away from the robots, running them like I have a crush on the way to the robots, running them through the crush as they come in and off they go. Like, you know, it's, it's even taken away that task of drafting them, like, yeah. you know, like, because I find I have a small enough separation area, so I find that tricky to do separate cows. But there is ways around it, like, you know, even without having to do it, you know, you just run it through. It, it, you, like, I find, looking back, is there is certain jobs where you say, well, we did them in the parlor as vaccinations or stuff, you know, where you'd be like, well, it does take a bit of out thinking outside the box and finding what works for you, but it is still, like, only a few times a year where it might just be um, a slight bit of a challenge, but nothing that can't be solved, like. Mm -hmm. It's a busy day, like, um, but I'd say it's a busy day if you do it on the parlor or if you do it on the robot, like. And, and dry-offs then is select, like you can do selective dry-offs, dry you know, you basically dry off on time. You wouldn't necessarily say, well, every Wednesday leading up to dry-off, we just dry everything off. Basically, you, you get a cow that says she's due for dry-off within the next five days, and you just dry her off. You know, or even if she's recommended to dry-off because her yield has gone down so low, she does come up as an alarm and you'd be like, well, Today I might just have five cows because that's how they do to carve in. Um, but you don't end up with as massive dry off days as you might be used to from a parlor system. You know, mm -hmm. you can just spread it out as you, you know, Same, yeah. you can do a couple every day and it just takes the pressure off, it dries them off that they have an individual dry off period um, and it takes the pressure off doing it like. Because I suppose you don't have the same, like, it's harder maybe to justify starting the parlor up for two or three cows that have carved first yeah, thing in yeah, the spring if yeah. you're in a seasonal yeah, system and yeah. you have dried everything off, then when you've got five or six all carving down at once, you'd almost rather turn the parlour on, whereas with the robot, yeah, yeah. one at a time doesn't matter and you've spread your system out slightly so that you might have five or ten who've milked through mm. because they're in calf that bit later. But I find as well as because... I myself know the way I do it, I put for dry off, for example, I put a cow on draft that is due for dry off, but I make sure it's, it's a draft that she's only after she's milked. Yes. Which means she's done the last successful yes. milking. There's none of this who hang around, when I will I milk and when will we dry them off? You should have breakfast before you go drying them off so that you don't know what's <laughs> going to be. There's all, we all read those sort of examples on yeah. how to best dry off, dry off. a batch of cows. Yeah. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that, you know, like, it, it's that she comes in, she gets milked, and she's drafted after she's milked, and she's there for you to dry her off, like, you know, and so... Easy. Easy. <laughs> well, it does take maybe a bit of pressure off, like, you know, I'd say it is a bit of a dreaded task, knowing, she's I have 40 cows to dry off there now, that'll be two oh, rounds of the parlour. It is a, It is a massive task, yeah, whereas... Yeah. You know, you can do it every day, a few here and there, and all of a sudden you have done 40 in a week, and you'd be like, hmm. oh, Jesus. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And then do you use the, are, are you selective dry cow therapy? I was thinking about it. I decided against it. I had my own reasons, but you can do it very easily because you can't see how the cell count is going. Yeah, I'm on selective yeah. dry cow. Uh, yeah, it works pretty well. Once you, but you have to make, like, make sure the cow is clean, like it would be the same in the parlor too, like, so there's nothing different, uh, only that uh, you just have all the data to back up your decision. And, and if there's any, there's different products like, so you can, if you were the cow with high somatic cell, you can hit her, you know, fairly hard. And if there's cows that are probably not bad, but probably not the best either, like there's probably products with not as intense antibiotics. So like you can have probably maybe two or three antibiotics that are for different cows, which is like, uh, all helps like with the antimicrobial resistance. So like, you know, it does give you the, the confidence to dry off a cow that, you sh that should be like a uh, well worthy of selective dry cow. Well, it's the information is there. So like any cow, you know, that you had an issue with during the year, if you treated her, it's, it's logged in on the, on, on the cow's record. So when you go dry off, you can see, look back through her history for the year. You can see if she was treated for mastitis during the year and you can see her cell count for the whole year as well, her average. And so that, that's basically what you make your decisions on, you know? And you have that information all year, so yeah. that's... But even not just how she did the last few weeks leading up to dry off, but how she did over the whole, whole, whole lactation, year, whole lactation, you know, yeah, like, yeah. It, there is that information where you see she, she's only slightly increased now because after being housed now, yeah. everybody's increasing cell count kind of job. Um, you know, you can make that really individual. 
And, and you can be hardcore because you do have actual values to it, um, where you can say, you know, my cutoff point is 150,000 on cell count. Yes. And you can just see how she's fared across, yes. you know, the whole lactation. Like, you know, it, you can be ruthless with that. Like. And the la well, my last question, um, how do you manage hoof health throughout the lactation? Hoof health? Yeah. There has been a huge improvement since we changed from to the robots. Yeah, like before, we, we pushed 10, 12, 15 cows through the, through the crush every year where a cow was lame and needed to be paired. And in the first year, we had one. We just won't cow in, in, in the first year. I couldn't believe the difference. And like, it was down to one thing. They were walking at the wrong pace. Do you routinely hoof trim? Would you no. pick everything up? No. You just let them Don't do themselves? Yeah. And it's not an issue that we're, 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 it's working, we're getting away with it. You know, so. yeah, I just hoof trim um, in the treatment box when I am, uh, say, when I'm drying off the cow, I put them into the hoof crate and uh, trim them and dry them off all together. So they get uh, one trimming a year, and then if it's a problem cow, she'll be dealt with uh, as an issue. But then, like, Generally, that kind of does a lot of cows. Like, there's only very few that might just have funny toes in general, anyway. So, yeah, about the same. Like, you just deal with cows if they do show if signs show, of lameness. Yeah. Mm. But even if they do show signs of lameness, it's because they can move freely once they have basically, you know, be it bandages or be it shoes or whatever. Um, you know, they can walk away at their own pace. Like, you know, they have the time to recover. Like. You know, there's no rushing them or anything or, you know, like they just motor away. Yeah, do you find that a lot of the benefits to hoof health are down to because you're not forcing the cow, so the pressure on the feet yeah. is, is reduced because she's distributing her weight evenly because she's choosing to do everything yeah. at her own pace. There's none of that, like you were saying, seeing the farmer pushing with the quad. Yeah. The impact that that has on feet, you don't realise at the time, and I suppose you're you're now all actively seeing that because the cow's just yeah, and she'll just take free. she'll take her time, and uh, you know, like if it takes her half an hour to go from the robot to the field, uh, like so be it, and she'll she'll get there without doing too much harm to herself. And then, if she did become lame and you treat her, they recover quite quick. Uh, but like lameness would be like uh, like wouldn't be really an issue now anymore. I have a final question, but just in case anyone in the room, is there anyone in the room with a question, burning question for the lads? <laughs> no? So my final question is, what has been your biggest learning process since switching, good, bad, or otherwise? What do you think is the biggest learning? I think learning to read information. Mm -hmm. You have so much information on the screen, you know, just, get, just learning to use it. I mean, when you're doing milk recording in a parallel, you record four or six times a year or whatever, and you get it and you look at it once, and that's it. <laughs> Whereas you, get, you have it all there on the screen the whole time, and just getting the, getting the time to sit down and look at it, take it all in, that's a big, a big change from what we, were, what we were used to, you know? I think that was one of the biggest, the biggest changes. So data. Data, yeah. Uh, utilizing the data, but also, mm -hmm. like, cows like routine, but so do I. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. It's basically... Like yeah. You readjust your routines depending on the time of year, but basically having your own routine down to a T mm -hmm. um, and, and making it through the day because there is a certain structure you do get through having fixed milking times as well. Yeah, it's almost similar. You just ha like you just organize. Robot you have to free you stuff. have to free them to organize yourself. Yeah, <laughs> so sometimes you need to sort of reinvent that. Yeah, it is like you know starting with calving, you know, and then feeding calves, and when do you get your milk? And yeah, and you know there is there are certain times that you have said like even now with breeding, you know, you do get the alarms during the day. You do know when a cow came on heat. When do I go out to AI her? You know, all, all that kind of like. How do I coax her out that I have her out? Do I leave her out to grass actually because she will not be due until for a couple hours after the gate change and she would most likely be going out to grass. It is very flexible, like what is you readjust yourself, you know, several times a year nearly. Like. Yeah. yeah, the data and um, how clever the cows are. <laughs> uh, I like that. Like yeah, if it would surprise you, like uh, what what cows would do when they're left off to their own devices, yeah. So like the, if you allow certain the freedom, like they they will make use of it and uh, yeah, do. It. 
to say I'm good. Amazing. Olivia, do you have anything else? Are we good? Um, I think no. I think I think we've covered. You know, we've covered most of the most of the main, main burning questions. Burning questions. <laughs> yeah, and the questions that we get most commonly asked, and hopefully we've fulfilled. You know, the the people of the audience and the people that are online to sort of. You know, we've we've given a a well-rounded overview. Overview. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think finally, thank you very very much to all three of you for being here tonight. It's been really, really good. Thank you so much for your input. And thanks. Thank you.